Welcome to yet another installment of Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy. We have with us today Vinnie Eastwood of the Vinnie Eastwood Show, The Lighter Side of Genocide, where he interviews all sorts of interesting people and not only shares valuable knowledge on the air, but he beats feet on the street and gets right up in the faces of the elite. So this man is no lip service in all action. He walks his talk. We also have with us today Max Egan. He has two YouTube channels filled with all sorts of interviews and empowering monologues. He's worked with people such as David Icke, Ben Stewart, and more, and has traveled all over the place doing public speaking. And he's even been to the Gaza Strip to show people firsthand exactly what the situation is like there that the lame stream news media does not want to tell you. So I'm happy to, to have them here today. I've been listening to both of them for years now, and they've definitely been an inspiration to me. So how are you guys? How, how are you all doing there in New Zealand and Australia? I'm, I'm very great. Uh, actually, and, and I'm glad I come from New Zealand where uh, our geographical knowledge doesn't make us think that the Gaza Strip is some place in Reno with a lot of titty bars. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm good too, brother. It's uh, nice to be asked on. Oh, really? As a dumb American, I thought it was a gambling casino. Dang. <laughs> get on down to the Gaza Strip. You might get lucky. <laughs> I'm not making it so, up. There actually is. One. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, and Vinny, you said you were at that music festival. I'd like you to play that recording that you you played for me b before this. What that you were blasting over the, the the megaphone at the thing. That was hilarious. Oh yeah, I was just walking around at night. I was kind of like volunteering at the Splore Festival. It's um kind of like done on uh, on sacred Maori land, and uh, the the people there are all really cool. And it's one of those places where you don't see many much aggro broke out, but there was this one aggro woman who was arguing with a whole group of people and a security guard just making everybody feel uncomfortable so i just played this at them and diffused the situation if you see drunk people being violent please ask them to drink more and drive home <laughs> and hopefully on a road where there's no people and lots of trees <laughs> Well, everybody understands that it's a joke, you know, and it's like nobody nobody took it seriously. It's just it's just the fact that it's really, really funny and done in the, that kind of like weird voice that I can do. Oh, uh, it, it sounds exactly like those announcements that I heard. At, uh, uh, they've got this festival in, in Australia. It's called the Big Day Out Music Festival, and they have these uh, repeated robot voices saying, drink plenty of water and blah, 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 that kind of thing. So I thought it'd be funny to just do it through a megaphone, <laughs> and I was right. Wow. Um, you, know, you know what would be really funny? Um, a person who would be really great to have with you, and in this way, too bad it's too bad he's in the United States and not over there by you, but my friend um, Richard Hamilton, who is actually a, a descendant of Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers, but he can do all sorts of voice impressions, including um, Henry Kissinger, Bill Clinton, um, all sorts of stuff like that. And it would be just funny as hell to have, like, the megaphone and have, like, Bill Clinton saying stuff like, Hey, Australia, bend over for the new world order. Come on, you know, you want it. And <laughs> whatever else. And just people come around like, what the hell? <laughs> oh, that would be freaking great. He could do Henry Kissinger, a whole bunch of different voices. be funny. Oh, yeah. Well, he has to take personal responsibility like a uh, like a free man should and get out there and just start doing it. Because, I mean, if you're protesting yourself being exterminated, why can't you have fun doing it? Yeah, there, there you go. Exactly. That's why, you know, the, the documentaries and Google Hangouts and radio stuff and all the stuff that I do, it's paradigm shift in educational comedy. Because the only way people can learn is if they're laughing and it's lighthearted. When you, people got all these stress hormones running through them and their brains all constipated, the information just cannot flow. Well, I, I think there's uh, there's two elements to it, and uh, one is the yes, of course, humor uh, does help people to understand situations and and not be you know overcome by them, but sometimes you do have to leave your comfort zone and you do actually have to bury your head into this really dark chasm of rabbit holes and there's not just one 
<laughs> you know, it's basically just an escape uh, to a large degree. And the reason why I use it almost as my staple diet is because I know how bad reality is, or at least a small fraction of, of, of it that's perceivable to me is not looking good. And so if there isn't a lighter side to genocide, you best fabricate one out of nothingness because the consequences of not doing it, of not having a laugh and not being able to retain your sanity can be very dire indeed. And if anybody's ever read a YouTube uh, comment section and all the crazy comments on them from very, 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 very angry people, you'll know exactly what I mean. Oh, yeah, totally. You know, I think... That is also one of the biggest part of, you know, creating our reality and law of attraction, whatever else you want to call it. It's not about, you know, having Scotty beam down a pizza in front of you. It's about being the change you want to create. And that has more to do with the attitude that you're putting out than it has, you know, whatever physical things that you're dealing with. Because, you know, it's people's hearts and minds that have to have that internal revolution before anything can happen on the external. Maybe, maybe not. I, I, I always shy away from saying the only way somebody can wake up is this or that or the other way or, or this is the way to cope with it. We're all snowflakes, really. There, there seems to be infinite different paths to the truth, uh, but only one destination. I agree, but let me, let me phrase that a different way then. What I'm saying is that because we're, we're not robots, who we are is what matters. And we all each have the choice of who we want to be. The elites have made their choice to be scumbags, and <laughs> everybody else has their choice as to what type of person they want to be as well. And it's who you are that's going to make the difference in this world, not, you know, how many MP3s you have on your hard drive, or if you have the newest Star Wars poster, or if you work at some company or, or whatever it's it's who you are as a person because we are people we're not robots we're not programmable machines even though the elites might disagree with me but <laughs> you know well that's i don't, what I'm I don't saying. know how, how do you how do you I, I i completely agree with what you're saying but i, I was i was thinking uh, i think maybe last week how many of my thoughts are really my own and how can i prove that they're really my own and then another thought hit me that's even worse. How can I prove that this, that I'm original? You know? It's like, when you get that kind of feeling and that sensation, it's really empowering. You can create new things. You can go out and do that. Um, but I find as soon as somebody starts asking for the evidence or, or whatever, you've got bubkas. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're original in your perspective, though, Vinny. You know, I mean, you're unique in your perspective of reality. Nobody else can have that. And it, and changing the inner world in order to change the outer world is, is the only real solution that we've got. Because once people discover who and what they are, they realize that, that everybody else is like that as well. I mean, we're all just born in houses and we get to these positions and we do things, you know. But the people in government, all the people that are running this whole control group, they're just people. And once we realize that and we realize that we're all on this earth together and that these guys aren't actually our rulers, they're actually our employees, then we can change things. But people have to change their inner perspective in order to do that. You know, they've got to change their perspective of who and what they are and and see their uniqueness. And I mean, you can prove that you are original because no one else has your perspective. You know what I mean? Nobody else will ever see the world through the eyes of Vinnie Eastwood, no matter how close that perspective comes. And that's what makes you you, that perspective. Mm. You know, well, I don't, once we I don't can know. see that in ourselves, we yeah. see that in ourselves, and we realize the uniqueness of ourselves and the perfection of <laughs> ourselves as well. Because mm. you're perfect at being Vinnie Eastwood, even if you've got flaws and you may be still finding your way through the mess, and you may not have everything right, you're still perfect at being you, and no one else can do that. You know? mm. I, so, I agree. You're an individual, and you're also part of the collective at the same time. Look at it this way: you got salt, and you got soup, and you put it together. Now try to count the salts in the soup. You can't. They're, they're one. They're one soup. But yet at the same time, the salt and the soup are still two separate things. Otherwise, you wouldn't have two different words for it. They're two separate things. But it, when they come together, they're one. People, don't re people put collectivism and individualism against each other in a dichotomy. And no matter which way you go, it, it inevitably leads back to tyranny. When you respect that both are true at the same time, then it deletes the conundrum you're having. It's like, okay, 
I can be a unique individual and a part of the collective. Both are true. Up exists uh, right alongside of down. Left exists with right. We're living in a fractal, you know. There's, there's separation and there's oneness both at the same time. They're both true. And it's just crazy to, to, to try to pit the ideas against each other. It's like a cat trying to rip its own tail apart. Why? Have you ever heard, <laughs> um, like, I, I don't know, a, a particular type of music that mixes two music genres uh, together and it creates a really new, awesome sound? For example, I listened to a, uh, a DJ at the Spore Festival who was mixing swing music from, like, the 40s and 50s with modern dance music. Now, does that... Is that defined as originality uh, in and of itself? Because what you're doing is just like your salt in the soup analogy is you're taking two things that currently exist, combining them together in a way nobody's ever done, and that actually does create in indeed something new. Uh, steel alloys and <coughs> things of that nature have been made this way. <coughs> And isn't that really what creativity is? Working with yeah. what currently exists in reality and then reworking it but with your As own a, ideas yeah. and then creating something new. Yeah, agreed. As a musician myself, I've done lots of exactly that sort of thing, and I love that. And I especially love what I like to do is I'll take a bunch of clips and stuff from songs and throw them together and add my own stuff in there and do all sorts of crazy stuff, and I have all these different songs. Then later, I'll come back and take clips from those and then add them together to create another new song. And you do that a few times, and eventually the end result hardly looks like it's original components. It's like something brand new. And I think that totally just, you know, proves the point of the fractal nature of the universe. Um, I like I like to look at it this way. Um, as far as our existence within creation, we're like uh, we're like kids playing with Lego blocks. The Lego blocks exist outside of space and time. God created those, or source, or whatever you want to call it, and those exist. But the child can use whatever of those blocks or not that they want and build those blocks into an original creation but the child did not make the blocks the child is using the blocks but that does not mean that what they built that child built with those blocks isn't original creativity does that mean inherently that everything we create is t inherently temporary i mean i mean let's think about this who's made something that will last forever <laughs> nobody well I would say yes and no to that question because technically the space and time are all ex it's all existing at one point so if it existed it still exists on some level and because energy is non-physical and I mean hey look at the files on your hard drive they aren't physical files in a shelf somewhere it's energy so if the universe is like a hard drive then that energy of those ideas can be tapped again I mean you know, you got you got to wonder sometimes when you have an inspiration, you're thinking of, man, how do I solve this problem? And all of a sudden you have an inspiration. Where did it come from? Did you come up with it or did it come from that hard drive of the universe? You you typed your search query into God's Google and, and hit the search button and bam. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Tesla comes to mind. He said something along the lines of um, uh, he knows that there's a source where all the inspiration and ideas come from but he's not intelligent enough to figure out what its intentions are. Yeah. It, it's like it, when you're looking at the universe as a database, like we tend to think of like a database as something we are outside of and that we're accessing and querying. It's easier to think of ourselves not just as that, but as also being a part of the data stream on the database. So we're like, we 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 in that sense, we are the accessor and that which is being accessed, and we are a part of creation in that way. Yeah, well, the, the problem is... Like that the infinity loop, feeding back into itself. Yeah, well, the problem is we're always looking through past past data to, to find a way out of this, you know what I mean? Like, we're here to create to the best of our potential, and what we're creating is limited by what we believe we can create, by our perception <clears> of reality is you know which is not real because it's fed to us by this system and what we're creating is a police state by our inaction 
You know what I mean? Every, everything in the planet, everything that we're seeing, all the problems that we're, we're facing are all because of our lack of creativity in dealing with the situation. We're, we're rummaging around in past data trying to find a way out of this. And really, all we have to do, I believe, is to rediscover ourselves. That's the way out of this whole mess. To start standing up and calling a spade a spade and speaking our truth. That, that's what we've got to start doing. I mean, the world's in a pretty drastic place at the moment. It really is. It's, it's going to hell in a handbasket very, very quickly. And if, unless people are prepared to stand up and start really looking at the situation and calling a spade a spade and standing in, in the power of their humanity, then we won't survive what's coming, I don't believe. You know, we'll destroy ourselves. We're destroying our habitat. We're destroying everything around us that we can really, really quickly. And we're destroying ourselves as well through all these wars and all this rubbish. Mm. And we can speculate on all this stuff. I mean, you know, inner strengths and all this sort of stuff. But, you know, ultimately, we're here to create and we're being curtailed in that experience. We're not allowed to create. We've got to walk between the lines and do everything we, that we, we can base our whole lives on supporting this system. And what we, we want to create, we believe we're constrained by the parameters of this system. We're constrained by what we believe reality is and what we, we believe is possible. Now, when you look at everything, you start getting, if you want to get spiritual about it and start getting scientific about it, you can look at things like the measurement problem and the double slit experiment and you start realizing that we create matter ourselves by observing it. So the, the possibilities are, are limitless. We could create any reality we want to create if we can just rediscover ourselves. So this is why I started, was talking to you about your perfection before, Vinny, because you are. You're perfect at being you. Even if you don't have it right, you're still perfect at being Vinny Eastwood. So, so you shouldn't be judging yourself by any other parameters except your own. And, and what you, the information that you're getting and what you're doing with that information and, and what you're creating with all the potential that you've got. You know, that's what we're all here to do. And if we can see that in ourselves and respect ourselves enough to understand our own perfection, then I believe we can respect others and all the barriers break down. And once we've got that respect for each other, we can stand up against anything government's doing because government's a fiction. It's just an idea that people made up. And these people are actually our employees. You know, and we're in a situation where they're ramping up all of this rubbish all over the airwaves about all of these fake terrorist organizations and all of these threats that don't exist. And they're using it to lock us down in a police state. And everyone's sitting here looking for someone to come and save them. They're not prepared to stand up and speak their truth and save themselves. Yeah. And that's the only way out. Im and that's the only way. Im Im imperfection is just an opportunity for perfection to manifest itself. I mean, flowers grow out of horse shit, don't they? You know, I mean. You may, you may be perfect at being in the imperfect state that you're in. You're perfect at being who you are. I actually whether that's, am, Max. Whether that's a perfect being or not, you know, but you're, you're striving to reach the, the fullest of your creative potential. That's perfection. Perfection is perfection for the whole self. You know, for the whole human race to create what we can to the best of our potential. And, and even if you've got flaws and even if you don't have it right, you're still perfect to looking at the world from the perspective that you have <coughs> and that perspective is valid. And once you can see the validity of that perspective, then you can see that everybody else's perspective is valid as well. And you can honor that. And all the barriers break down with these people. You know, our biggest problem is that our societies are too busy arguing amongst each other while the politicians that we've employed to run our infrastructure are trashing the world and running off to the bank and locking us all down in a prison. That's the problem, you know. Our divided societies, because we're, we're judging ourselves by all these parameters, and we're looking for spirituality in books by other people and all sorts of ways. We're not, we're not really applying ourselves to the world. We're not looking yeah. at ourselves uh, from the correct perspective. We're looking at the world and our relationship to the world and other people from the correct perspective. That's the problem. That's yeah. the whole problem. And all, and, 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 all, all, and all the books tell you is to get the real information and look within, but we're so controlled. People are like, I can't look within. What's in there? I need a babysitter to tell me what to do yeah. well, they don't or, a, or a president or whatever. You know. Yeah, people aren't even observing what's, what's in front of them. You know, it's they don't like, understand what look within means is the problem. They don't. They think, oh, what am I going to do? Sit there and meditate. They don't understand what it means. You know. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, what I what I'd like to do here, I you know, I typed up a little um, you know text uh, description for this for this talk, and I'm you know that I'm going to put in the YouTube. I've already put it on Facebook, but um, I just want to read this off right quick because I think it it totally embodies what we're talking about here. Um, as <clears throat> excuse me, as world events continue to intensify, and more people awaken every day, there is an initial sense of fear, panic, and helplessness on behalf of the awakening individual. 
societal uh, the societally programmed mindset of poor little me what can i do kicks in as a result of the collective stockholm syndrome we have all been subjected to through the various societal systems of indoctrination so thick is it that even many within the truth movement and independent research community have a tendency to react purely on the fear and old dogmas that they have been programmed with. As we proceed forward into a seemingly uncertain future, many people are awakening from their awakening as their minds clear, the fear subsides, and they begin to understand the mechanisms that work in this world and take positive, constructive action and utilize practical application of the knowledge they hold instead of diving into fear, adversity, and conflict with their peers. Vinnie Eastwood and Max Egan are two such people, and Dave Kelso will be speaking with them about how to not allow fear to dominate you, so that you being yourself to the fullest and taking back your power in your own life can further assist with the overall process of a humanity that is awakening from a very long nightmare. Love and light is not about loving only those who agree with you and running towards the light because you're afraid of the dark. The light illuminates the dark room of this world so that we can be aware of, see, and understand the mess to be capable of cleaning it up. Love is having compassion for your fellow human beings instead of trying to ignore what is inconvenient to the ego. Shunning the dark gives it power, so be a lighthouse instead of diving into pseudo-spiritual in, uh, pseudo escapism. Viewing the negative negatively is not positive, it is negative. Viewing the negative as a positive opportunity to create positive change is positive. What do you all think about that? Yeah, well said. I, th I think you. that uh, uh, the whole concept of enlightening people is, is you know, exactly as you've pointed out it's not to avoid the dark stuff and and i, and I think I, I said words to those effect earlier and what we were saying just before is also about that look within and people don't know what it means um when i was 12 years old i came up with a saying the problem with my generation is that people read between the lines so much that they miss the lines entirely <laughs> true they're not seeing they're not understanding they're not comprehending and what occurs to me is that a lot of it's not actually their fault, no more than a rabbit's, no more than it's a rabbit's fault for <clears> being <throat> shot through the head with a twenty-two rifle by a farmer. Yeah, I was just, I was just telling online. I, I was telling somebody basically something to that exact same effect. So that's that's good that that you brought it up. I was, you know. Well, I think about all the influencing <laughs> factors, you know, when you, when you go up, because um, first of all, you get imprinted with a lot of the um, uh, sustained indoctrination that your parents remained imprinted with. And if they'd managed to wake up, then they'll uh, raise you up more or less as a, 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 a well-to-do child. But even if that's the case, you still then uh, can go into school. If you're very lucky, they might homeschool you. But if you are going to school, then of course you've got all the indoctrination that the school puts on you and all the uh, social conformity and things of that nature. You know how you've got all these little social groups over here with the goths and the, and the, uh, uh, the jocks and the, <coughs> and the nerds and the so on and so forth. And everybody's been putting into these little groups so that nobody's actually really being seen uh, so much as an individual individual as they are members of a particular group with any associated stigmas or pluses <coughs> that go with it and yeah, on top that, of that that's... then you get into the workforce or, or into higher university education and then of course you've got fashion and and your new cell phones and the new technology and of course facebook and youtube and all of these yeah. other things that you're uh, we're all participating in on a kind of mass scale and at all times, whenever you're using something, it is having an effect on you. You're not just the one affecting it. Whatever we change kind of also <coughs> seems to change us a little, or at least that's what I've seemed to learn. And yeah. it is such a emboldening and empowering thought to know that despite all of those ridiculously massive influences that have cost huge quantities of planning and time and effort in order to put in to prevent us from waking up, people are waking up anyway. Ironically, yeah. in a large yeah. part, using the very mechanisms that were built to keep us asleep. 
Yeah, I I absolutely love that. Like when I was a kid and a teenager, I used to be so depressed about how I just was not able to fit into the system. Then as I became an adult and started to wake up more, I look back, I'm like, oh, thank God I couldn't fit in. I would not want to be one of these walking zombies that don't know what they're doing. Yeah, well, see, that's the thing. You know, people are programmed. That's why you can't hate people that are asleep. That's why you can't do what we're doing out of hatred for the elite, out of hatred for anything. I mean, even with what I, I do when I speak out against Israel all the time, it's not a hatred for for. The, the people of Israel, it's it's because I love life. It's what's happening to the Palestinian people. You know? and, and the people of Israel that are doing this are doing so because they're programmed, so you can't hate them. You know, even if ISIS was real, the way they say it is, the people that are doing that are programmed. I mean, it's, all, it's all programming. It's all a result of programming. Yeah. I think people have got to put down all of their ethnic uh, division. They've got to put down all their religious division, or put down all the names of their countries and realize that we're just people. Ideologic, having- ideological division, too. I mean, even within the truth movement, it's like, oh, those weren't planes, those were missiles. No, it was CG holographics. It was a death ray. Well, who cares what it was? You can all agree that criminality happened, so let's come together on, on that and launch some investigations and, you know, let the semantics reveal themselves. But no, instead, mm-hmm. pe- people are bickering and bitching, and it's like, guys, you're only doing what the elites want you to do. Yeah, I'm correct. Yeah, and yeah. everybody who disagrees with me is a shill mm. or an agent or somebody or being paid off by somebody you know just jumping to these conclusions uh, I mean like this has happened with me where I've said something and I've been wrong and instead of saying Vinny you're wrong here's the facts and evidence and me going oh okay <laughs> my bad sorry about that this is actually what's going on uh, fuck you Vinny hey. you're a stupid moron and you have no intelligence and you're a shill and you're an idiot and you're okay dude you have I'm no back integrity in, backing and, away slowly <laughs> you work for the FBI you were sent here to infiltrate you're trying to screw me over and inform on me etc 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 now I don't know what the problem is with these people um I think that it's probably the exact same problem that I suffered a number of years ago, not having any friends who thought like me and having most of my family think I'm crazy. That made me really, really antisocial, really hostile, very angry and accusatory all the time because not only was I really uh, angry, about all the crap that's going on, but also kind of a bit afraid that it's going to happen to me, or currently is happening to me. But also, nobody understands, and nobody yeah. cares for one, me one, about this yeah. funny, such a terrible situation that I'm going through. And I was one, just, thing, one thing that, I, that I've told uh, pissed off truthers many times, as I've said to them, there's only one difference between a truth, the you know these people in the truth movements, uh, truth yeah the truth movement and a sheep, only one difference between the two, and that's the sheep has an excuse for their ignorance and you don't. <laughs> you know they're supposed to know better, they're awakened, but they're still they're 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 worse than the sheep because oh, now they can they can feel even more self righteous than any sheep ever could about remaining in their ignorance. <laughs> yeah, totally, bro. I made up this Facebook meme and said that truth is really arrogant and and um and rude to to ordinary people, and they just call them sheep or sheeple. And I think this is absolutely uncalled <laughs> for, completely unwarranted, and they should be called slave scum. <clears throat> yeah, like um today, um my friend um on on DeviantArt he goes by Crimson Falk, but he he was getting upset by. One of these people who just, you know, couldn't understand what he was saying about this stuff. And in the conversation, I replied to him. I said, when a person can only reply with parroted narratives because they believe life is like an episode of the Brady Bunch and that corporate corruption, parentheses, and its influence over governmental bodies and the media, close parentheses, doesn't really exist, that's usually... When I throw in the white flag and just go silent, I ask those types of people questions and they quickly prove that thinking critically is not trendy for them. 
they either reply back with the closest narrative they have on file in their program neural networks of their brain, or they ignore the question and counter my question with a question that is nothing more than yet another narrative. This is exactly how Hitler was able to deceive and program the German people. Conversations with people like this, metaphorically speaking, are like this hypothetical illustration. So Dave, how long have you been gay? Well, I'm not gay, I'm straight. Dave, that's not what I asked. I asked, how long have you been gay? Could you please answer the question? Um, like I said, I'm not gay, I'm quite straight, but thanks for asking. Why do you think I'm gay? Come on, Dave, I'm merely asking you a simple question. Why are you making this conversation difficult? When you answer with something that is outside the box of their preconceived reality, their brain simply just can't go there. They aren't trying to be mean or difficult with you. Their mind simply cannot go there. The answers that are outside of their box sound like nonsense to them, as if you are replying with, well, just walk across the rainbow bridge to the mystic cloud and consult the unicorn of knowledge and all will be revealed when you eat the magic candy canes he gives you. Then you wake up later, and they took your freaking kidney. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like on Charlie the Unicorn. Damn, that was some candy, creepy stuff, man. Candy Mountain, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> this is just so dodgy, that yeah. video, man. Oh, my God. Max, have you seen Charlie the Unicorn? Max. No, mate. No, I haven't uh, Haven't seen Charlie. Oh, it's yet. creepy. Shun, the non-believer. Shun, Shun. Oh. <laughs> hey, I was talking to Charlie Beach, right, in the Love Police a couple of years ago, and uh, I was talking to him about that video, and he was, he was like, yeah, somebody came up to me in, in, the, in, in the thing going, Charlie, Charlie, and I didn't see the video, and I was like, what the, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> hey, have you, have, you seen the, have you seen the ASDF videos? ASDF? No, no, I, I, I don't know what that that anac oh, acronym uh, stands for. Oh, it, it's it's um, well, it's basically if you look at at least on an American keyboard anyway, A S D and F are in are in sequence. I don't know how it is in Australia. Yeah, that's, a, that's exactly the same. <laughs> okay, but um, anyway, it's just it's a series of of just funny little cartoons that that someone made, and they're just really crazy and off the wall. And when my friend introduced me to that, I'm like, oh, man, I know what I need to do. So I created um, a PSEC, which is short for Paradigm Shift and Educational Comedy, a PSEC episode called PSEC 2015 ASDF, a not-so-educational parody. And uh, it takes clips from various other, you know, PSEC episodes and stuff that I've, I've done with a little bit of new footage, too, and basically parodies and includes some of the... Um, you know, original ASDF stuff. Like, have you ever you ever seen that Hitler meme? You know, like Hitler complains about the Cubs. Hitler complains about this, and uh, you you ever seen that meme? No, I don't don't think so. Okay, well, there's this popular meme where there was a movie in um that was made in in Germany. It's in German, of course, about about Hitler and all that. And there's this scene where he tells everybody but a certain few people to get out of the room. He starts yelling and screaming and bitching about stuff. And in one part of the scene, he just slams his hand down on the desk. Well, in, for ASDF, there's um, a character called a mine turtle, which is actually a landmine turtle. If you step on it, it explodes. So I, I edited that, that Hitler thing and it made it so that when he slammed his hand down on the desk, he slammed his hand down on the mind turtle and boom. <laughs> it's, it's funny. You, you, you'd have to watch the, the oh. original cartoons and then watch my parody and then it'll be funny. Well, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how parodies work. They don't, the, the jokes don't make any sense unless you've seen the original. Yeah, I'm just saying I recommend you look at it sometime. You'll be like laughing for a day straight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I did a, um, a string of memes. You know that scene from uh, the movie 300 where, where he talks about uh, how many soldiers you've brought or whatever? I turned it into um, 300 protesters. <laughs> he goes, welcome to the protest, Leonidas. But I see you've only brought a handful of soldiers. You over there, what do you do for a living? I'm a chartered accountant. 
<laughs> and you, what is hey, your um, what is your profession? I'm a school teacher, sir. Um, and sorry, you? Sir, oh, yeah, what? <laughs> so, well, sorry you to interrupt me right in the middle of. Okay. I'm I'm sorry. I just got a I got a message here from um, um uh, my, my my friend Katarina. She's a a dear friend of mine. She's into you know paradigm shifting and all this stuff, and she travels around the world. I see her in person sometimes too. Um, it seems like she's asking to be a part of this conversation. Um, would you have any objectives if I if I brought her on or objections if I brought her online with us? She's really cool. I think you'd love her. Oh, only if she interrupts me in the middle of things that don't make sense. If you get interrupted in the middle of them, I apologize. It's just I got this message and I just wanted to. So I know. Yeah, I mean, that tell. couldn't that couldn't have waited a few extra seconds, bro. Sorry, I just, you know, my brain doesn't multitask text and voice at the same time well. It, like, shatters, so my apologies. My dysfunctions aren't your fault. <laughs> well, well, bring her on in then anyway. It'll create a lo lovely diversion for this otherwise uh, 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 fiasco. <laughs> well, Katarina Edwards is, is joining us here with Vinny Eastwood and Max Egan. Which one is which? I'm the one with the. Which uh, voice? Hey, oh, this will this will be great, Max. I'll just tell her that I'm the one with the New Zealand accent, and he's the one with the Australian accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll work. I'm oh. sure. You too. You've heard Max Egan before. I've even used some clips in in of, from him in my PSEC stuff. So speak, Max. I know she's heard you before. Max, I know she's heard you before. Uh, yes, I remember that deep voice. Yep. Okay, lovely yeah. to talk to you. Yeah, I'm the one that's a little bit more <laughs> high pitched and slightly more youthful and exuberant. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you, Vinny and Max. Yeah, it's very nice to meet you too. So, yeah. um, he, just... he's the he, he's the one with the stamina of a kangaroo on male enhancement products. <laughs> Melon Hansen products are they like the uh, the Vicodin that you get from Marilyn Manson's products? <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! You all sound like you're having a really fun time tonight. We are, we are. I'm glad you could synchronistically join us. Yes, I'm too. Very cool. So, so carry on. I don't know what I interrupted or didn't interrupt. Like, you, you, there's you, a whole bunch of penis jokes and all that kind of fun stuff. You, you synchronistically in interrupted just a moment of absolute insanity, so it's fine. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm having my moments of that tonight, too. We all have our moments. <laughs> hey, in fact, uh, I was at the uh, uh, music fest, the Splore Music Festival, and I was doing uh, volunteering, like for the parking and stuff. And all these people dressed mm -hmm. in white costumes and stuff started coming down the hill. And I go, "Where are you guys off to?" And they say, "Oh, we're off to have a white wedding." And I go, "Oh, it's a nice day for one." <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's funny. It's a nice yeah, day you should, for you, you white wedding. You should yeah. have. You should have asked them, "Where's your hoods?" <laughs> <laughs> They'd be in the suburbs south of Auckland. <laughs> or in Sherwood Forest. Oh. Okay. Well, anyway, um, what were we talking about before we got in here? Oh, yeah, we were talking about memes and comedy and, and, and stuff like that. And I don't know about you guys, but I, I kind of have to rely on trying to make people laugh almost all the time like you know how there's a, there's mm -hmm. always a funny guy in the room there's always a class clown yeah. <laughs> that kind of thing and, and you just you just happen to be that person i think just like everybody's got their natural talents and whatever there's there's a there's a use for them somewhere mm -hmm. and and sure enough i found that making people laugh and, and giving them a cackle or whatever sort of raises the consciousness level a little bit especially if you do it quite a lot and I was just thinking about this the other day. You know that um, that study that they did where they measured whether or not you, if you smiled at somebody, would they return your smile or, or how many uh, times would they smile at somebody else? And it's kind of like a net gain mm -hmm. of seven. So for everybody you smile at, they'll on average smile at about seven other people. <coughs> so you think about that, yeah, the kind really. of... 
uh, uh, ability that we have just doing like little simple things about making people happy or making people feel better, uh, giving people big hugs, giving them a big, a big grin or, or telling them an incredibly shitty joke. Uh, these things are actually yeah. really, really good for humanity in general, and it sort of oh, drops a little really? pebble into the consciousness pond and sends those ripples out. Yeah, and on this uh, and on this recording, we got two funny guys and one funny girl. So anybody who lifts the, it listens to this is going to be paradigm shitting all over their ego for the next week. Well, it's so funny, Dave, because Paul and I we actually make it a game every time we go out of our house which, you know, you go out to the grocery store or something like that, we actually make a conscious effort to smile at everyone we see, even if they look like <laughs> having the shittiest day ever. And we actually have a running joke <clears throat> with a lot of the cashiers that we see often. And, you know, because they actually start to notice us because, you know, we're the ones that are in there and smiling at everyone. It's pretty noticeable. But it's just funny because a lot of them they recognize us and they instantly <laughs> smile when they see us from now on, even if we don't smile first, because you've just kind of programmed them to react that way. Because yeah. there's a couple of them, you know, will be standing there at the, the cash line and they'll have the grumble, grumble, grumble attitude. And, <laughs> and Paul is like unrelentingly happy towards them. <laughs> a smile and, a day. You know, it's almost like, a smile what? a day keeps. I said, a smile a day keeps the mental malware away. <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, and keeps so the psychiatrist because... away. I, I was talking about this uh, <laughs> this morning, and one of my listeners yeah. said, um, I told my psychiatrist the other day, I wouldn't have any mental problems if I had people who thought like I did no, around wait me. Wait a minute. So, sorry to interrupt again. Max is having audio problems. He just um, he just, um oh, typed can't a hear message you, Max. saying, can, can you hear me? And the answer is obviously no. Um, if you drop him out and then re-add him to the call, it might be able to reset it for him, bro. Yeah. Um, hey, Max, if you can, if you can hear us, um, how about hang up and I'll just I'll pull you back in and we'll see if that corrects the problem. Yeah, that should do fine. There he is, and he's and he, and he's gonna be a coming back. <laughs> I love this whole uh, kind of field that I've found myself in the middle in. You know sort of like being the comedian of the truth movement. Oh, we're all being exterminated and, and, uh, and enslaved. It's hilarious. Let's see if we can hear Max now. Max, say something. If you see something, say something. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about... Oh, wait. We still, we still can't hear him, apparently, so... No. May, maybe he accidentally muted his mic or sound settings or something. Maybe a computer reboot is in order. I think this happened the time me and Max tried to interview Jordan Maxwell. Like, Jordan had these really bad technical problems or whatever, so it wound up being Vinny Eastwood, Max Egan, and the ghost of Jordan Maxwell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember that. I, re I remember that one. I totally remember that. And and when I say a reboot is in order, I don't mean a new world order. Just, just to clarify. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Well, just as long as we uh, hit the restart button on this uh, on this dead uh, machine. So, uh, Max is just going to drop out on us for for a couple of minutes uh, while he reboots Skype, and then he's going to reconnect soon. Um, and this is the thing about radio that I find very interesting. Like, I've been working with a couple of different people over the years, you know. And mm -hmm. some people, when it comes down to like the technical wire and, and what have you, and you're like down to the seconds, uh, they get really, really flustered and stressed out and kind of like aggro and, and what have you. And I, I've even done this myself, you know, like <laughs> especially with live radio. If you're like coming up to the effing wire, there's no room for error and you've got thousands of people listening and what have you, you don't want your voice to be cutting out. You don't want your Skype to accidentally drop out for like three minutes of, de of dead air you know uh, I mean you don't want the uh, entire internet company to go down for a period of 90 minutes right in the middle of your two hour show <laughs> no kidding yeah that happened when I was interviewing uh, Tila Tequila that was freaking crazy man you've interviewed Tequila Tequila yeah 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 <laughs> I think, so uh, I, think I, I think you should interview Katarina next because she's awesome. Well, okay. Aww. <laughs> I, well, well, Dave, you have to give him some premise. What? 
probably doesn't have, if he's interviewing Tila Tequila, he probably doesn't interview just anybody. Well, actually, I was for quite for quite a time just interviewing pretty much anybody, um, but I've kind mm-hmm. of decided not to do that anymore. It's just like I don't know why, but uh, it seems like you can get a whole lot more out of somebody who's really, really good at it. And there's t- there's way, way, way too many people out there who are really good at talking about uh, different topics and, and and things like that to ever interview them all. And um, Mm -hmm. I'm coming back to like four days a week now. So I'm going to have eight hours uh, of content to fill up per week. And it would be cool if they were all like really awesome in-depth interviews with A-listers who who were like (laughs) teaching at at universities and making scientific discoveries and and that kind of thing. Because I've done things like uh, interview for three hours a dude who's uh, raising somebody else's child who has mental disabilities. (coughs) You know, mm-hmm. or yeah. Um, yeah. people who've had their children kidnapped by uh, the state and gone through uh, 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 abuse and rape and, and things like that. And yeah. it's really, really cathartic for those people who nobody knows. Um, but the problem is nobody listens to the interview because nobody's ever heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's like this uh, this double edged sword and what have you. So it's like you know, um, who who was it? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, what I what I've noticed though, and you know, sorry if this it, it sounds to anybody corny or trite, but one thing that I kind of had to learn is just like Max has said many times, the universe has a synchronistic flow, and when you let go to that, amazing things happen. So what, when I stopped trying to be interviewed or interviewing people, all this stuff just aligns so naturally. So when I'm interviewed or when I'm interviewing somebody, the universe just clicks it in. Like I, I would not have thought in a million years that today, right now, I would have been on a call with you and Max. And now, to add even more improbability into it, Katarina's free, and boom, she's here, although Max is having temporary technical difficulties. Um, but, you know, it's just, when I learn to more let go of, of ego, trying to micromanage everything, then things just opened up. I mean, you know, I've talked on, on Type 1 Radio, I've been on Journeys with Rebecca, I've been on 32 Degrees of Insanity with Donnie Gilson, and so on and so on, and I've been with JP and Bull Spirit Radio, and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and all of these things happen synchronistically. Anytime that I've ever tried to micromanage it and try to lock things into the alignment that my ego preferred, I just could not get anything done. But when I let go, I'm like, fuck it, okay, universe, I'm just going to let you take care of this shit. I'm, I align with people left and right. So, you know, the I ego do that too. really gets in the way. <laughs> I, I do that too, except it's called having two hours of regular radio every day of the week that you have to <laughs> fill up the schedule with. And it's pretty difficult to fill up the schedule with goodwill and synchronistic fairy dust. Sometimes you actually have to call the people, email them, organize a time for them to show up, find out what their phone number is or their Skype, you know, little things like that. Oh, well, obviously, I mean, I get to know people first, but like the fact that we're even on right now, call it synchronistic fairy dust if you'd like, but that's how it happened. <laughs> It happened because I made it happen, you know, you were tagging me in posts and I just said, hey bro, you know, if they're not relevant to me or whatever, yeah. and then you say, hey, can I interview you? And I'm like, yep. And you're like, oh, I like you and Max Egan. I go, well, I know Max Egan, I'll bring, I'll bring him along too, you know? And, you know, things do happen like that sometimes. Yeah. Um, but it was still a synchronistic alignment. If you would have asked me the day before if I thought that, you know, Vinny was going to pop on and be like, hey, what about this tagging? And, oh, let's get on an interview. And, oh, let's bring Max. And I would I would have thought that it was highly improbable. I'd have, I'd have, I'd have thought that, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, it's just these alignments. Obviously, when you make an alignment, yeah, you have to do your part in it. It's not like these, you know, these freaking airy fairy new agers talk about where, oh, just sit there and meditate and do nothing and, you know, a Ferrari's going to appear in front of you or some bullshit. But, you know, well, it's actually about when you following align, uh, your instincts and you, your brain will tell you something and uh, you think, man, that's a really good idea. 
But if you don't get off your ass and do it, within five seconds, your brain pulls an emergency brake and you don't do it. Um, and you can you can hum for days, weeks, months, even years on that uh, on that pulse that's coming through your head, all these ideas or, or, or whatever. But uh, most of us, we kind of like sit down and we set a uh, exact time, like I'm going to watch this 90 minute movie, or I'm going to watch this 45 minute episode of The Walking Dead, or I'm going to uh, uh, play a strategy game for, for for an hour or or something of that nature. And during those mm-hmm. time frames, we'll have uh, um, little ideas here or there that we think, oh yeah, yeah, that's interesting, and then we completely forget about them, and they're gone. They're gone forever. And when you learn to quiet the noise of the stuff that you're doing and pay attention to that voice, that, uh, that, little, that little pressure inside your head that's telling you to do things, that's when you'll start to really, really tap into the synchronistic streams, man. That's crazy. I agree. Oh, I, like I, I, I agree. I had, uh, in a 72-hour period, one of my listeners came around and popped 60 $100 bills on my desk to get my new computer uh within 24 hours of that uh i'd uh, emailed back a person who was wanting to donate me a little something uh to get for that computer as well he donated 1500 us dollars and then the very next day i interviewed a, a doctor told him what i was doing with the computer in the documentary and he gave me 500 us dollars so it was kind of like things just sort of steamroll over and come to you exactly when you need them and the exact amount that you need them. I can I completely agree. I mean, you know, a lot of these new age types, they're so materialistic and trying to manifest stuff. What they don't realize is what the universe does is manifest opportunity, not stuff. It's up to you to listen to your intuition and recognize the opportunity and take that opportunity when it comes. But the universe doesn't manifest stuff. It manifests opportunity, and through opportunity you can get stuff. But it manifests opportunity. Yeah. I made an internet meme the other day. It's got like uh, uh, seven people all all standing up there with their arms clasped, and they're like in 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 the beautiful sunset and that kind of thing. Like, oh. And it says, never complain, never fight back. Ignore the suffering and pain of others. Be a selfish, ignorant wanker. Everything will be fine. New ages. <laughs> <laughs> new ages. For fuck's sake. Oh, then I love the new agers who get pissed off at, at, at the new age movement, but they're still new agers, but then they're in denial about being new agers. So then they're like a self-hating new ager. Like, have you ever heard of Jordan Levine? Wait, wait, wait. Would that make them a new rager? Yeah, yeah, there you go. Hey, that's that, that's going to be a new term. People like Jordan Levine, they're not New Agers, they're New Ragers. Yeah. I like that. Because they're New Age, <laughs> and they just happen to be really angry about all sorts of stuff. Yeah, like, frickin' Jordan Levine, like, he was he was up on, you know, on Facebook and, and bitching about, you know, Teal Scott and a bunch of, or Teal Swan now, and, and a bunch of other people and stuff, and like, oh, they're MK Ultra and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, all Teal Scott does is she gets up there and she's just honest about how she feels. She's not like, oh, I am the goddess, follow me, bow to me. In fact, she's usually up there talking about her dysfunctions more than she's talking about anything lovey lighty. And, you know, then it's like, here, here he comes all, all butthurt, just bashing on people. And he was completely ignoring anything I was saying, although some of his little followers were, were trying to beat me over the head with stuff, and I was just playful with them. And mm. it got to the point where, you know, the first time this happened, because Katarina tagged me in the post, I got intuitively impulsed, just like you were talking about, and I'm like, oh man, I'm going to load up a Google Hangout, I'm going to turn on screen share, and I'm going to see who wants to join in with me to, you know, point out all this dichotomy bullshit that's on the screen. So Katarina and my friend Rich, I would mentioned him before, um, Katarina and my friend Rich, they aligned with me. We got up there and we're just reading off comments and pointing out dichotomies and laughing our asses off and being like, oh yeah, Jordan Levain, Jordan LeButthurt, you know, and just like, and it, 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 it ran almost five hours. The time seemed to fly. And that's, it's amazing how many people have actually, it, it's so comical and informative that they 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 actually try to sit through the whole thing or they they watch it like 
in pieces as time allows, but they're not like, oh, this is too long, fuck it. They're like, they're hanging on the edge of their seat because they're, it's just so comical and funny. And not just because of what me or Richard Katarina was saying, but just the sheer stupidity on the screen before us. It's like Comedy Central, man. It was hilarious. So <laughs> aligning with that brought more people to my channel. In fact, I, I met a new friend by the name of, of Cassie who only lives an hour and a half away from me because of that video. If we had not made that video, I would not know her. And she's an awesome person. Uh, it's like what did, what did I say? The uh, the problem with New Ages is they think that their thoughts alone are enough to change matter. Therefore, they don't actually have to do anything. It's a complete yeah. it's a complete misunderstanding of what quantum mechanics is. Exactly. Uh, and it's like for me for my money, uh, the thing that we have as humans is imagination. We can picture things in our heads that don't exist. Nobody's ever built it nobody's ever brought it into reality yet we can see it and mm -hmm. if we want to if we put the effort in we can take that thing that doesn't exist and will it into existence and what happens then is everybody else that's here with us in the 3d universe can see it can touch it can use it can learn from it can do something and it actually inspires this entire mass effect on everything uh, allowing for all these little synchronistic occurrences that wouldn't have occurred at all if you just kept that idea in your head, forgot about it, and never did anything. Yeah, totally. Um, one thing you might want to listen to sometime that I think you'll laugh your ass off, I made a, a parody of, of the song Walking in a Winter Wonderland, but it's called Dealing with the New Age Paradigm. And it just makes makes fun of just the whole New Age dogma stuff. And everybody I show that to is just rolling on the floor laughing. So if you want to be tortured by my singing voice, you know, just go to my channel and type in Dealing with the New Age Paradigm. And I, I always thought that uh, uh, the KKK should release a Christmas album called White Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. <laughs> I actually made a graphic a long time ago that was like a, a mock KKK album along, you know, a, a similar sort of theme. Obviously, it's not a real album, but just a joke graphic. But I actually, I, I made that. It's on my Deviant Art. But <laughs> wow. Yeah. I, I love coming up with uh, like original jokes and, and, and things like that too, you know? You're just sitting there and you're thinking about there's something really, really lame or mundane or, or whatever, and you find that you can actually make a joke out of it, <laughs> you know? And, and it's like one of those profound realizations that you, you, you never uh, forget is that if there's an opportunity to make a joke, it's an opportunity you should take. Max has still not returned. I'm thinking he's maybe having more serious computer issues than at first we thought because he's not online yet. Yeah. Well, let's just roll on anyway. We don't yep. have really much to lose in the, t in the way here. Obviously. Now, questioning this, um, a lot of people get into the truth movement. Uh, I want to just say something here. A lot of people get into the truth movement because they want to have some of the successes of some of the people that they've seen that have done that have done all these things, you know, like uh -huh. the, the David Ikes and the Alex Joneses and things like that. Um, and they discover pretty in short form that it doesn't just magically happen, that they <laughs> have to actually bust their hump for years and years and years and years of editing and, and being on the radio and writing and, <coughs> and Facebooking and, and advertising stuff out and, and, and what have you before you see any benefit, let alone massive benefits. Yeah, there's another irony about that too. Because it is a law of quantum physics that what you resist persists. I've noticed that the people who really, really, really don't want the attention are the ones that draw them to it the most. I mean, look at Max Egan, how he started, I don't want to show my face, it's not about me, it's just about the information. I'm just putting this out, use it if you want it, I'm just a regular person, I don't want all the attention. And it just came to him to the point to where now it's unavoidable. It's like he's up there in conferences and being videoed and, you know, he's doing the thing with David Icke for a while and so on and so forth. And, you know, so 
he was really resistant against the idea of being in that limelight and what you resist persists. So there he is. And <laughs> yeah, but of course the, uh, the, what you resist persists thing doesn't apply to everything. It's, it's like, Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. It, it kind of works in a very, um, when there's no reality involved kind of thing like no actual real physics involved then what you resist persists but when there is actual 3d universe involved and there's there's uh there's laws of physics and things of that nature what you what you resist gets resisted i mean saying what you don't what you resist persists in the in the political game for example is like saying whatever tyranny you support automatically just destroys itself and doesn't harm anybody it's freaking stupid (laughs) i mean like how are we supposed to not resist tyranny? You know, ah, oh, don't resist, ah, yeah. oh, don't resist this ruthless a uh, 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 bunch of criminals yeah. that have been setting <laughs> up this apparatus very, very slowly until well, the point low, where it's absolutely yeah. irresistible. <laughs> don't resist them at all, yeah. no, well, they're, because they're, they'll just persist. <laughs> no, there's, there's, there's more than, there, there's more than one context for the word resistance and in the context that i'm speaking of what you resist persists think more electrical you know because we do live in an electrical holographic universe i'm talking about it on the electrical level of course you know obviously what you're saying holds true you know like if you if you sit back and do nothing then tyranny is just going to continue to expand by default of our complacency. Although if you're really denial, about, denial, yeah, if you, resi- it, you know, you resist accepting an idea, that idea it, will still persist. So in that exactly, context, it does work. Exactly. That's exactly what I was about to say. Great minds think alike. I was about to say exactly that. And you like spit it out, like right as I was thinking it. So yeah, exactly. Re- uh, uh, people don't consider complacency, is a form of resistance, but it is because if you ask the question, why am I being complacent? It's a resistance against the idea of looking at knowledge you don't want to see. No, that might hurt my ego. It might scare me. I don't want to look at that. I'm going to cover my ears and hum now. La, 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 la. So it's resisting the knowledge of something that makes that something continue to persist. When we resist the knowledge of how this world has been operating and we resist it with our blind complacency. I mean, look at the DEA's war on weed. Has weed gone anywhere? No. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I'm trying to resist the idea that there's people out there who smoke weed and get inspired by it and stuff and create music and all this creative stuff that we can't when our small minds and our alcoholic beverage containing livers. (laughs) Look at these, yeah. What is wrong with these people? And and I don't know, it's like this lack of self-analysis. Really, ultimately, at the end of the day. Don't you think that's true? Everybody's just sitting around looking at everybody else, judging everybody else, judging everything everybody does, but not <laughs> taking a look at themselves and going, oh my God. And they go, what, bro? I, I just looked in the mirror, man, and I look like a douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> In, you know? in, 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 in introspection scares the shit out of people I mean, you've got to ask yourself on a, what was it there was this great philosopher i can't remember his name his, his initials are r-a-w raw um and he says this the story called the ballad of the cosmic schmuck you know cosmic meaning big schmuck meaning idiot for the uh, mm-hmm. the uninitiated and he said what you got to do is you got to sit there and wonder whether you are the cosmic schmuck Am I the big idiot in all of this? If you're wondering that, then you're probably not the cosmic schmuck. <laughs> but if you never, once in your life, take the time out to look in the mirror and go, Am I? Am I the cosmic schmuck? Then you probably are. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know what? A part of what Katarina does for a living is helping people clear those sorts of paradigms and come out of their complacency so i would actually like katarina to talk for a little bit on her experiences with not only her own mental malware that she's worked through but helping others with theirs and what it's reflected she's got a lot of stories she can tell so let's let her tell them i'm just so fascinated by this back and forth i was just like feeling like i was just a bystander it was really interesting (laughs) hello hello (laughs) Ah, yes. 
We love you. Don't worry. Oh, no. You guys are hilarious. <laughs> I'm really enjoying this. So ask me a specific question because that is really, really too general and vague with everything that it is that I do. So, Okay. How, how about this? List off some of the things that you personally, within your paradigms, have gotten butthurt about and why. Subcategory, biggest issues. Hmm. Well, I think that for most women, the mental malware that's really very present in most people that I've dealt with has just been the whole body image, self-image issue. I mean, it's one that really encompasses a whole lot of the self-worth and the shame and the guilt and all of the crap that people end up using as their the, the fork that they stick in their foot, you know, that keeps them from moving forward in their life. And so, I mean, a lot of the women that I've dealt with have really been using that as their self-sabotage from, you know, not taking the next steps forward in their careers or not making that first YouTube video or not getting on the radio or not doing the things that would really help spread consciousness and awareness in the world. And so with a lot of the women that I work with, it's really about deprogramming their brain from even going in that direction of sabotaging themselves because they have all of these beliefs that say, oh, well, I can't talk to people about wellness or anything because I am not well myself. Or I was actually just sitting and having a lunch with a woman today about that. I mean, she's been this radio networking maven for the past 10 years and she still has her own physical issues that still trip her up from actually sharing and teaching in person. But, you know, there's absolutely no reason on earth why she can't be doing that on online. And she does, and she has a humongous following. And, and it's been so beautiful to watch people like her and others sort of just come out of this, uh, I don't know, just this, this, this fog of these, all these mental programs of <laughs> thinking that they can't do what they want to do in this world because they somehow are flawed or that there's something wrong with them. So, yeah, I, I love helping people do stuff like that. So, I mean, today, actually, it's kind of funny that you all were like, hey, come on right now, because I'm actually working my way through um, putting together a course syllabus for the local area that I live in Austin. And and I've been coming up against my own issues because, you know, most of the communications I've had with people have been over the Internet and through the online sphere for the past couple of years. And so, like, getting out there and, like, actually speaking to crowds of people is, like, terrifying me right now. And I absolutely have no reason why I have no problem speaking to people. It's just it's just like these ideas that creep up sometimes in the back of my mind, like, oh my God, they're going to hate me. They're going to throw tomatoes at me. You know, just these, these societal programs of people thinking that, oh, well, public speaking, that's scary. Like, well, you can't do that, blah, 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 because everybody's afraid of that. And so, yeah, I've been dealing with my own mental malware about that for the past couple of days. And as I've been going through it and writing my press kit and writing my course syllabus and everything, it's just some like, like almost like hyperventilating panic attacks, even though I have all of these skills and all of these tools, you know? So it's just so interesting. Even the people who are super developed and people like me who've overcome fibromyalgia and all the kind of crazy things that I've overcome in my life, you know, we still can have these fears and all of these, these really, really entrenched fears that can kind of come up and, and want to, like, jump in our way. It was like the boogeyman in our closet. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the answer to your question, Dave. Yeah. Um, Is there somebody per- with a lawnmower over there, bro? Um, not that I know of. I was just readjusting my my mic it's volume. Because <laughs> I, I, I muted. Let me lower my mic volume a little more. Is that better? Does that eliminate the noise? Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, it's like the lawnmower man up here. Okay, sorry. I, I didn't know it was up that loud. My bad. But I was just going to say that, you know, it's like when it comes to like public speaking in person, it's like I'm not really 
afraid that anybody's going to like dis- dislike me or like throw tomatoes at me or whatever. I'm just afraid that Henry Kissinger is going to magically appear, bend me over, and butt rate me for the glory of the New World Order. Because that's obviously a real fear that any public speaker should naturally have. <clears throat> <laughs> I do. I do quite a bit of public speaking, and not once have I have I feared the shaft of uh, uh, Mr. Kissinger, who is arguably the world's ugliest ladies' man. Uh, or is he the world's ugliest lady who had a sex change and now looks like a man? That is possible that we can't prove it kind of like how you know um barack obama's married to michael obama um <coughs> michael <laughs> <laughs> terrible. I, I got tired of kids oh, <laughs> oh yeah that was, a, that was a good old joke from way back in the day what time is bedtime at michael jackson's place when the big hand touches the little hand yeah yeah michael obama was just like no matter how much I beat my penis, it still won't behave. So I put it to death and became a woman. Oh. <laughs> At the electric chair. <laughs> Talk about a weenie roast. <laughs> hey, speaking of which, I was, I was, uh, I was at a dance festival, right? And this dude comes, comes walking down the road, and he's wearing these incredibly tight. Uh, silver reflective plant pants, and I go, "Whoa, man! That makes that brings a whole new shine on the word mirror balls." <laughs> it was uh, really disturbing. Uh, I wonder if making fun of things has been like a survival mechanism for some people. Like, if you can actually prevent insanity from coming on by having a few laughs about it. Or if you can extend people's lives. Because I thought about like uh, Patch Adams and, and, and what have you. The amount of healing that laughter can bring. Is that, you know, something that's valuable to I people anymore? I that. Well, can can, I, I, can I, I talk about this for just a second? Because people accuse me of being unprofessional. And, and you know, they're, they're right to a certain degree. But my argument is the world's currently run by professionals. How's that working out for you? Yeah, I mean, when you when you think the word <laughs> when you think the word professional, do you think fun, friendly, happy, and and uh, and inspiring? No, you freaking don't. You think of dull, predictable, and uh, 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 proficient. Basically, it's it's basically just an an efficiency game, so that the possibilities are quite small. There's no there's there's very little room for error. But I think what a lot of professionals really are starting to do massively wrong is avoid any kind of failure whatsoever and in so doing they don't really learn anything a lot of the time nothing nothing radical anyway by taking these big risks when i when i think of professional i think of bill gates sticking a three-foot vaccination needle in my ass that's you know hey guys What's up? I actually have uh, something to contribute to this point because, Dave, remember I told you about uh, the, the new person that I met that was a lawyer and is now a therapist? Uh huh. And you have a picture yeah. of her climbing the and tree. I have her, I, and, I got her, and I got her to climb a tree on our walk the other day. <laughs> I have never um, seen a lawyer in a tree before until then. Thank you for that new no, experience. No, not even. Not even a lawyer, but a lawyer therapist. See, as <laughs> much as you'd like to see lawyers, hang, as much as you'd like to see lawyers hanging from trees, you just don't see it that often. <laughs> well, right. Uh, the thing was that she was sharing with me just how she got out of the the law profession, which she was in for twenty years, and she ended up going to be a therapist, thinking that that would be somehow better. And then she realized quickly that that was not exactly the thing that she was wanting to do either because, you know, she's a bright, sunshiny person, but she had been kind of glossed over with this veneer of professionalism that has really kept her from reaching people. And so she was drawn to me because of what I do is different than what therapists do. And it's much more personal and, you know, you actually get somewhere. <laughs> like, so she, by the end of our, our walk together, she was like, I really kind of want to go climb that tree. But she was second guessing herself and being like, well, I don't know if I should because, I, you know, that's not really like in my realm of, you know, 
practices is to go randomly go climb trees. <laughs> and so she was climbing trees and running up on off the cliff and not off the cliff, but she was like on these caves that were on the side of the cliff and just really like laughing like a child. And it, it blew my paradigms out of the water because here I am thinking like, oh my God, what am I, how, who am I to help this lawyer therapist lady who was like this <laughs> pillar of respect in the community <laughs> help her through her baggage, you know? Like, yeah. And so it was just really evident to me to see that that kind of structure is really not as sturdy as I once thought it was, you know? Yeah. So she, people so she, are people. So, so she was just like, well, being an Esquire for the Crown Corporation wasn't working out for me, so maybe the MK Ultra industry might be more fun. But then she found out that didn't work for her either, so climbing trees is now her new profession. Oh, yeah. I had a really interesting <laughs> talk with her about the direction she's wanting to take with her practice. Since she uh, started climbing yeah, trees, fine. since she started climbing trees for a living, has she had uh, 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 more roots in her life? More what? More roots. <laughs> More roots. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Re- re- roots is uh, is uh, New Zealand for roots. K- kind of like those commercials about dick maintenance. You know, they have a bright, shiny dick. Have you seen that? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> funny. Yeah. It doesn't yeah, sound I anything like a New Zealand accent, but it's still funny. Now, now, I've, now I've got the kids all over me, Dick. It's like, okay, great. You know, but me personally, I know that I'm not crazy at all, and here's how I know. The voices in my head told me so, and I trust them. Yeah. Well, you know, Perfect. if Dick Maintenance isn't on your list of priorities, you've got your priorities uh, uh, in, the, in the wrong areas, mate. I mean, really, really, you've got to maintain your outdoor areas just as much as you do your indoor ones but anyway we're getting off the topic we'll be talking about the dick insider corporation soon <laughs> yeah dick insider yeah. every but every woman likes a little dick insider now man yeah. oh god <laughs> I, I love the ad for that yeah they get a little aussie oh, kid howdy i'm spike that one no, there's a, there's a little kid like they're, they're, they're advertising the uh, the Dick Insider Corporation, and and he goes, "My mum loves a Dick Insider." <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> well, like... I, I, I I heard a parody a long time ago to where it's like, "Hi, I'm Spike, and I, I go to Dickens Dickens Fruit Stand, and I really love their cider." And going on like Dick Insider, even my wife. A little dick insider now and then. All the ladies love dick inside. You know, it's just going on and on with all wow. these d- d- different puns. And yeah, I'm like, oh, it's, man. it's really just already <laughs> gone too far, bro. Have you ever noticed how sometimes describing how somebody else takes it too far, you inadvertently take it too far yourself? Yeah. Yes. Just <laughs> and and the same principle is true when you've got a dick insider. Yeah. <laughs> Because when if you're if you're taking it too far, you've definitely got a dick inside her. Well, you know, I mean, if you can't take it oh. inside her too far, what can? Um, speaking of which, I want to really kind of uh, uh, change myself a lot. You know, I'm just totally taking a, a different route here, and there's a lot of things I want to change about myself. I've realized that I'm really angry and rude to people, you know, like, <coughs> like really, I'm, I'm kind of disrespectful and uh, arrogant, you know. Well I'm, I'm, well, I'm sorry, you can't change the fact that you're a clone any more than Max Egan can change his prosthetic face. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know what it is, it's like. So many people are real proud of themselves, and and they don't, you know, admit their faults very often. And uh, me, I'm I'm kind of the opposite. I'm very ashamed of myself, and so I admit my faults as often as I can. Um, in so doing, <laughs> I hope that it'll help me to prevent myself from becoming like the douchebags I I don't like. I was just thinking about this today, bro. Um, I could have with my talents sucked up to powerful people up to powerful politicians parrot their garbage just like 
any of the other mainstream media is, and I'd probably be uh, sitting pretty right about now, but I didn't. Instead, I sucked up to all the people who've got nothing, who uh, protect their country with what little resources they have, who uh, attend protests, who read documents and, and, and laws and, and things like that. Um, and in so doing, instead of gaining all the uh, trappings of success from people who could just dump you as soon as they want, I gained <coughs> a, uh, a track record of, of street cred for doing the right thing for the right people and getting the uh, information out there that nobody else can really be bothered filming, editing, and uploading. You ever been to a protest, bro? Because I see shockingly large amounts of people with video cameras there. You know (laughs) how many of them wound up being uploaded that I can search for to see some videos of protests or speeches or anything at all? I was halfway tempted to go to Occupy Chicago, but I didn't. But me personally, I don't suck up to anybody. I just respect people to the best I can, and I'm I'm honest about my feelings, even when and especially when they don't agree with me. And it's that sense of honesty and, and integrity, and you know that respect's got to go both ways. Obviously, like you know, if you don't want someone getting you know butthurt about a boldly honest opinion that you're saying, then you got to be open to the idea of not getting butthurt by somebody else's opinion when you're really not liking their opinion and just respecting your right to be like all right i don't like that i don't agree with it but you know it's all it's cool it's it's your opinion it's fine and that really relieves a lot of internal stress because then there's no energetic vampirism going if you know you're not getting butt hurt and they're not getting butt hurt and there's an integrity that builds yeah like the use like the integrity of using the term butt hurt for example and I was thinking about this, my, uh, my friend Catherine Smith, she edits the New Zealand Journal of Natural Medicine, you know, I consider this woman one of my mentors, one of my many mentors. Um, she once told me, Vinny, there's two general rules, don't take yourself too seriously, and don't take what other people have to say about you personally. Exactly, I agree with her. Mm. And you know, people, people are like, oh, this is a bad word, that's a bad word. It's like, you know what? Words are just noise with syntax, and from the perspective of the birds, it's humans chirping nonsense, so come on. Yeah, I mean, and if you don't like bad words, then you can suck a duck. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) uh, 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 Whether you want a a dick insider or some dick maintenance to keep your dick nice and shiny, it's all good. Yeah. I mean, just as long as you don't elect a dictator. Yeah. Because nobody wants tater tots on your dick. Yeah, di- di- dictators, though, they're usually working for the Illuminati. Yeah, well, they, they have interesting growths on them at any rate. Um, well, they're probably Monsanto, you know? Like, taters that grow in the shape of a... Yeah. <clears throat> By the way, um, <laughs> just to give you a little bit of an idea, you know how I said I, I made that um, Christmas parody? I'll just do a... I'll, I'll sing a quick bit of it. Five, just because I want to torture people. <clears throat> um, look around, life is a malady, but you know you create your own reality to keep evil at bay, just wish it away. Dealing with the new age paradigm. Get the new car if you wanna, just visualize, get what you thought of. The secret is out. So no need to pout, dealing with the new age paradigm. Unfortunately, there is just one problem that these new agers seem to have missed. You manifest the core beliefs in your focus. Hey, moron, what you resist will persist. So-called gurus and all the mimics seem to ignore the quantum physics. If you don't emotionally clear, you'll get it in the rear. Dealing with the new age paradigm. <laughs> and if you want the version with music that isn't half-ass over Skype, just go to my channel. And if you're if you're listening to this, you're already on my channel. So just search for Dealing with the New Age Paradigm. <laughs> yeah, this is very wonderful. Thank you. Quite welcome. Thank you for that tambourine accompaniment there. That was good. Oh, yeah. I, I got it when I was in the in, in the tambourines, you know. 
<laughs> First to go, last to know. Oh, I thought you were in the Kiwis. No, we, I, you know, I, I love the Kiwi Air Force. There was a, there was a study done, and they, they predicted that if we were invaded by a country of any uh, military capacity, our air force would last about seven minutes. And guess what? A Kiwi is a flightless bird. And guess what the mascot for our entire air force is? <coughs> <laughs> oh, this is just a brilliant idea right here. You know, I mean, uh, if symbols have any effect. Then, then wouldn't you want like uh, the New Zealand hawk or, 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 or something or like the New Zealand kia, which is like a really cheeky parrot kind of thing that'll like eat your window wiper. Um, they'll tear your window wiper blades out of your car while you're up in the mountain skiing, bro, for the day. <laughs> they're, they're, they're real cheeky. That would be a really awesome New Zealand Air Force mascot, don't you think? Would be like or, the, uh, the or, mosquitoes or maybe- of the sky just buzzing around, pissing everybody off. Or how about the New Zealand Velociraptor? Yeah, there is no New Zealand Velociraptor. But hey, we, there might have been there might have been about fifty million years ago. Uh, well, I'm not even a hundred percent sure about that either. Because I interviewed. That's why I said might have been. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering because like I, I interviewed this dude a while about a while ago, like years and years ago, who's actually writing a book and making a documentary about real life dragons and dinosaurs and things like that existing at the same time as man. And, uh, one of the exhibits that he has was a, um, a Creek bed in Texas where they have human footprints and dinosaur footprints in the stone walking side by side. Yeah. And there's an account from Alexander the great when he was, uh, conquering Persia, that he encountered something he called an elephant eater, a really, really huge lizard with a massive head and two little scrawny arms. And he lost, I think, uh, a, a whole bunch of men and a couple of elephants, and he had to actually use uh, catapults to bring it down in the end. So I was like, whoa, this is some really interesting, like totally messed up factoids there. <laughs> it's like... Bro, yeah. have you ever noticed that whenever you start to look into almost everything you've ever been told in your entire life... It's bullshit. A, a lot of it, yeah. Just like just like fossil fuel isn't actually fossil fuel, it's the lubricant between the crust and the mantle. And when they deplete a well, wait a couple of decades, and oh look, it's all filled up again. Because what is that well? It's just a crack in the crust and fluid seeping through from the space between the mantle and the crust. Do you know where the theory for fossil fuel came from, bro? Not specifically, but do tell. You ever heard of the La Brea Tar Pits in L.A.? I've heard of I've heard of tar pits in general. Yeah, well, in LA they got these ones, and they have um, this is like in, in the central city, kind of kind of somewhere. I mean, get down one boulevard. I, I, I went there, but I can't remember. I was like relatively small, but uh, they found animal bones and plant material stuck in the tar pit. So they said, ah. This tar must be made out of animal, uh, out of decaying plant matter and animal bones. Same principle as looking at a vodka martini that's got olives in it and going, "Aha! This entire glass and the and the liquid must be made out of olives because it's got olives in it." That makes about as much sense as a scientist walking in on you eating a girl out and going, "Aha! Vincent Eastwood must be a pussy." Um, <laughs> you know, like. It makes no sense. Yeah, right, eh? <laughs> <laughs> now, a, lo- a whole lot of things are actually based upon that amount of understanding. And mm-hmm. I think the, uh, the stupidity level that everybody's talking about, I don't know if you've ever seen these uh, videos about people going around asking real simple questions to Americans or, or whoever... Really, oh, I've seen yeah. ones from Britain. I've seen ones from uh, uh, from Australia too, where the people are just as freaking stupid. Now, uh-huh. I think that we're so freaking stupid that we don't know how stupid we are, and the smartest of us are still pretty freaking stupid, and we still don't know how stupid we are, right? I was just yeah. I was just coming to this realization the other day. Oh my god. I'm actually a bit of an idiot a lot of the time. 
you know, so, I do so, stupid the, things. The so-called Mayan primitives understood that we live on a planet in a solar system in a galaxy in a universe and even understood that there's twin black holes in the center of the galaxy. And then here comes these people coming through, so-called advanced Westerners, that think they're going to fall off the edge of a flat Earth. And they call these Mayans primitives simply because they're in a tropical area and maybe not wearing much clothes, but, oh, they must be primitive because they're just running around in their freaking underwear amongst the trees. They're primitives. But yet these people understood shit that, you know, even in the last 10 years, science has only confirmed some of the stuff, like the center of the galaxy and stuff. They knew all this shit. It's in their documentation. But, you know, yeah, here comes these Spaniards. Oh, yeah, we're afraid of falling off the edge of a flat Earth, but we're the superior ones. Fuck you. Yeah. It's funny you <laughs> mentioned the flat Earth because I was just actually watching, starting to watch a documentary about the flat Earth kind of thing today. And mm. here's the evidence for the flat Earth that, that I've seen so far. Number one, it doesn't matter how high you are, how tall you are, how low to the ground or whatever, the horizon always appears flat to you. It's, an, it's always in a straight line. And it doesn't matter if you go up in a balloon or anything like that. They've got the footage and it all just keeps looking, the horizon line always keeps looking the same. Whereas if you were uh, uh, on a curved surface, you would only actually have to be looking a few miles before you could start to see the curve. Like a boat, for example, going down a river that's a couple of miles away from you, let's say you've got a telescope, you can still see him, he'd start to actually go down the curve and he, and he, and he uh, wouldn't be able to do that, right? Something would change, but it doesn't. And I've only like 15 minutes into this documentary before doing this thing. And I'm like, you know, for all the other stuff that I've learned, that I've found out to be BS, that I thought was absolutely concrete and thought that any alternative was absolutely completely crazy and freaking stupid, uh, almost all of those things have happened to be <laughs> not the way I thought they'd be. So why should the earth being round be make any freaking difference? <laughs> You know, I'm just starting to look at the evidence, and I and I haven't made up my mind yet. Still, extremely yeah. freaking skeptical. That's only like two things that they've managed to show in like uh, out of 15 minutes of a documentary. So it's not <laughs> going that fast. Yeah, I mean, we think that the peoples of of the past had a lot of arrogance and hubris, and people usually refer to the flat Earth mentality, but. You know, if we really look at today, we look at all of our our quote unquote advanced technology and our tech toys and we're like, oh, look at all we've accomplished. This means we can never be wrong about anything. So whatever we feel is right. So we're going to make it doctrine and call anybody who questions it a conspiracy nut or a terrorist. We have way more hubris and arrogance and blindsidedness now than we ever did when Columbus was sailing around mistaking the new world for china um i, I thought it was quite funny that uh, uh eddie is a british comedian he said that england went around conquering the world with the cunning use of flags and went into in into india and they said boom we claim this for the king and uh indian guy comes up to him and he says hey hold on you, you can't do that this is our land there's, there's like half a billion of us here and we've been living here for thousands of years British guy goes, do you have a flag? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of like pe pe a lot of people think that just because words are written on paper and we call it law, that it magically prevents crime. Like it's a magical piece of paper and anything you write on that paper, all these magical force feeds and things come up and just magically prevent criminals from committing crimes. Because, you know, people always say, you know, when you when you talk about, you know, corporate corruption and government and stuff, it's like, but that's illegal. If anyone was doing that, they'd be in jail. 
Really? Because it's written on a piece of fucking paper that puts up a magic veil of protection. Yeah. Right! Ignorance of the law is no excuse, and that's why they create thousands of laws every year. <laughs> to make sure no- <laughs> that are thousands of pages long each. <laughs> hey, I, got, I, gotta, I gotta hand it to the um, Australian Prime Minister, though. He, he's the only one that I've ever seen who actually admitted that for every new law you create, it creates a crime. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, that's very nice of him. I'm sure that he's uh, very happy to be saying that when he's creating two, three laws a day. Yeah, totally. And he, he, he just totally looks like, you know, Agent Smith from The Matrix. Yeah. Oh my god, he actually does look a little bit like Hugo Weaving. That doesn't even occur to me, bro. <laughs> wow. That sounds Mr. about right, doesn't it? Mr. Egan, we've missed you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know what happened with Max. It's, uh... I don't know. He's just like, like you know, I, I I don't know. Maybe maybe Kissinger got to him like I was talking about before. Let's hope not. But you know, you know what it. I reckon it was <laughs> you you and me bantering all the time and not letting him speak, and he got bored. I don't know. <laughs> he spoke quite a bit though, and we were gonna let him speak even more. But I don't I don't think he would fake an audio problem though. I mean, he's got integrity. If he if he really didn't want to be here, he'd just be like, you know, I'm. You know, going elsewhere now. Talk oh, to y'all yeah. later. Well, sometimes the uh, the note, problems guys. are so bad that it's you just can't. My be. bedtime. All right, go for your life. What's up? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> we've, we've, like we've, we've, Vinny. we've only got fifteen minutes left anyway, so. Well, I will let you finish it out. I am gonna go to bed. Hey, do us a favor Thank first. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Do us a favor and first, kind of like we did on Donnie Gilson's show. Why don't you give people your information so they can, like, stalk you on Facebook and YouTube and stuff? Um, okay, well, I really just like people finding me through my website because that's how they can find me on the other stuff, too. Just KaterinaEdwards.com. K-A-T-E-R-I-N-A-E-D-W-A-R-D-S.com. Oh, I thought it was Katriana. No, it's not Katriana, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Donnie's like, Katriana. It's like, er, it's not Katriana. It's get her in. I have never heard that iteration of my name before. That is the very first time. He was a winner. It sounds yeah. like name of Russian prostitute. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. A name of a Russian prostitute. <laughs> or, is that, or, or is that Katriana? <laughs> Countryana, there we go. Yeah. Countryana, oh. yep. Oh, yeah, it's God. like Americana, except for a country. My, 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 my last girlfriend was Finnish, and the way she would say the word can't sounded like cunt, and when I pointed that out, she's like, ooh, I'll overemphasize that now, because I can get away with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and ironically, she was never finished with that joke. Yeah, exactly. Mm. You know, we've got uh, almost a uh, uh, hundred unfinished songs. And and only half as many on Swedish ones. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, love you, appreciate you, Katarina. Thank you for synchronistically popping on. Oh, love you too. Take care. Later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Now it's just the two of us, you and I. Mm-hmm. That's about right, isn't it? I believe... Uh, that I've got to take a wiki leak. So I can hold it for the next 15 minutes, I think. And what do you reckon, bro? Do you think we're actually going to, like, beat the New World Order? Or are you like me, where you reckon, <clears throat> just do what you can anyway? Who gives a crap whether or not you win? Well, my perspective on that is a lot longer than 15 minutes, and I suck at summarizing, but I'll try to do my best here. Um... As corny as this may sound, and I'm not just talking esoteric, I mean, I've seen this in my own experiences. It seems that because the frequencies of reality literally are rising and we're moving more towards actually a better planet of integrity, let's face it, if this place was as horrible as people think, we'd all be clueless and there'd be no awareness of all the all the crap that's going on, much less talking about cleaning it up or anything else. It's like 
you know, anything that is of the lower, older frequencies, as frequency continues to rise, starts to crumble. So that's why you see the elites getting all nervous and making stupid mistakes and their false flags and infrastructures crumbling and people getting butthurt and the system becoming more transparent as the factions of elites try to fight each other for domination and so on and so forth. And these people, they're so arrogant that they don't realize that everything that they're doing is more likely to destroy themselves before they get the chance to destroy anyone else. I mean, imagine just a, a retarded psychopath, half drunk and on crack and on the high of his arrogance, thinking he can fly. So, you know, I'm going to walk off this cliff. You know, I mean, that's metaphorically what the elites are doing. They don't, they don't realize how much they're hurting themselves way more than they could ever hurt us. You also got to realize that these elites are the most insecure, immature people on the world. How much more insecure than a 14-year-old emo girl do you have to be to think, to, to genuinely believe that the only way to keep yourself safe in your reality is to control and dominate everybody else? That is like the epitome of insecurity and immaturity and denial and you know, they're caught in their own matrix way more than we are because they forgot one key thing. You can't be the warden without being in the prison. Or like they said on the Matrix movies, the machines are subject to their own rules of the Matrix. They can't violate them. So they're caught in their own web. So, and like you said before, the more they pull bullshit, the more people they're actually waking up. It's ending up having the opposite effect. So... The more people wake up, it destroys their systems of control, and the more fearful and arrogant these elites get, they, they screw themselves over just with the, the blind spot of their arrogance and hubris. We're given birth to a better world, and no birth is without labor pains. The earth simply does not have the benefit of an epidural drip. So we see all the bullshit that's always been there because we turn the light on in the room now, and now we get to deal with it. And... The first step in dealing with it is getting butt hurt as hell, and we see that happening. When we pop out of our complacency, it's just like we're like a little kid being told that we can't have ice cream before dinner. You know what I mean? So I think it's a, a painful, chaotic process, but the physics itself assures that you know the New World Order is screwed and humanity will prevail. My only question is, because of free will, because every individual has their own choice, you know, how many of us will have to die prior to getting to that point? That I can't answer. You know, we're going to make it as easy or hard on ourselves individually and collectively as we choose to make it on ourselves. And so I think, yeah, humanity is definitely going to move into that better world and in our lifetime but how painful and nasty that process is going to be or not i can't answer that for you it could i wonder be the if it'll be a, a a cold war between the the competition of ideas or a hot war um and blood in the streets it's be, it's it's been both you know people are always wondering like the they're, they're afraid of world war three because they're, they think of World War III, they think nukes. But what World War III really is, is the world being at, at war with itself for the third time. And since the Korean War, the, the world has not stopped being at war with itself. You know, back in World War I, they didn't consider it World War I. There's all the different battles and campaigns and conflicts. Then World War II comes around. They didn't view it as World War II. There was D-Day and this and that and so on, and all these little campaigns and conflicts that... They viewed as separate things. It was only compiled as World War II after the fact. So we are in World War III right now. People are just, half their mind is stuck, in, stuck regretting the past and the other half is stuck worrying about the future that nobody puts together where they are right now. We're in World War III. It just hasn't been labeled that yet because it's not behind us yet. Oh, uh, I reckon it's the war on drugs and the war on terror. You combine those two puppies together and the amount of suffering and pain and destruction and death, etc., that have been caused worldwide as a result of it, not to mention the expense 
of fighting both those wars, there's probably a hell of a lot more damage and more money spent than World War One and World War Two combined. Yeah. Now I don't think we're going to have a global hot war because if you if you look at the at the trends, you're noticing that it's it's not really countries going after countries it's well, well, countries hold it, on it's, a second. It's, it's countries being divided against themselves you, you were probably you're right you're probably not going to have a hot war you know why because all the nations seem to be demilitarizing uh, slightly and uh, the, under the UN regulations and all of the armies are being folded into NATO which will be the new pseudo private army which will even kill the elite, any even the, country yeah, even that resists elite. Even the elites know that n nuclear is uh, mutually assured destruction, so they only wave the nuclear sword of Damocles over us to keep us in fear, but they're not actually going to do it because a narcissist does not want to blow themselves up while they're blowing everybody else up. It's didn't, stop them from, didn't stop them from uh, dropping Hiroshima and Nagasaki after the Japanese tried to surrender like nine times. But that's not a full-scale, you know, three-plus super powers launching, you know, enough nukes at each other to, to turn this planet into this planet into asteroid field number two. Oh yeah, but you, you know, they you know think that these people that. are just immature and kind of narcissistic. I also maintain that they're completely insane. Completely but, insane people with huge amounts of of uh, things. It's like you wouldn't do that because you're actually sane. But to say that they wouldn't, even though you know that they're completely out of their minds, I really can't speak to that with a whole lot of surety. Well, even the most Especially because they even, can just jump down into their little underground uh, cities that they've got built all over the place with the deep underground military bases and just live under there for a hundred years. I thought, wouldn't that be some poetic justice, eh? So, bro, you're, uh, you're going to lock yourself underground. Yeah. In, a in, the, in the dark, with some of the worst sociopaths, criminals, pedophiles, rapists, and murderers that have ever lived for a hundred years, eh? Okay. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be fun, mate. <laughs> You're welcome to it. I'd rather die out here in the radiation. At least it won't stretch my anus ring. Yeah, another thing that I... That, um... I've noticed as far as a, a misconception people have, like, if people look into a lot of what um, Putin has been doing, um, you know, people notice that he seems to be against the, the globalists and for the people, and then the other half are saying, oh, no, no, that's just a psyop. He's with them. He's not for the people. I have a third option. A third op the third option is very simple. He's an intelligent man, and he's a chess player, not a checkers player, and he plays to win. So if he sees that going against his fellow globalists and aligning with the people gives him the winning move, he's going to take it. And if the original New World Order plan of annihilating everybody was going to win, he would take that. He doesn't care about the people. It's not, about, it's not even about caring or not caring. He's in a chess game, and he's in it to win. So it's siding with the with humanity against his globalist peers is going to win him that chess game, then that's what he's going to do because that's all it is to him is a game of chess. He's a smart man and he's playing to win. Yeah, and it's he knows that you only get out what you put in. Yeah, what you put in. But yep. Oh, there's actually a joke about that: a bass drum, a thimble, and a cymbal fell off a cliff. But um. Yeah. <laughs> and people also see some of these, you know, American politicians that are all of a sudden siding with the people against the globalists. And when people see that, they're like, oh, well, there's some politicians that are good. And yeah, they're for the people and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, wait a minute, put on the brakes. They are wrath jumping ship. They see that the globalists are going to lose in this awakening, and they see that the globalists are selling each other out. These are people that would sell their own mother for a quarter if it served their agenda. They are just rats jumping ship. 
So that's why they're all like, oh, bad Illuminati. We're all for the people. Yeah, look, see, I'm a politician and, and I'm good. And, and no, they're only going to do as much for the people as they know that they could do without the blackmail that the globalists have on them coming out into the press. I mean, look at Petraeus and things like that. They try to move too much in a positive direction. All of a sudden, oops, scandal. So, you know, these are just rats jumping ship. They, they never cared about you. They do not care about you, and they never will. They're kissing their ass, they're kissing your ass to save their own. These are rats jumping ship. These people are not your friend. They're not your pal, and they don't care about you. If they have a track record of doing it, then they probably are your pal. If they've gotten demonized all the time and attacked in the media and, and uh, had their cars stolen and their uh, family killed or something like that, they might be on your side. But if they're elected officials, they got no problems whatsoever, and they're going through a whole bunch of think tanks and things of that nature, and they're starting to tell you things that you think you want to hear, be very, very suspicious. Yeah, and they and they have a track record of voting on on bills that they never even read that are nasty and unconstitutional. Yeah, I mean, you got to realize the elites are the elites are waking up too. They're just as much in the matrix as we've been, and they're waking up to reality too. But they're waking up in the way a psychopath would wake up, not in the way a regular person would wake up. It's mm -hmm. like, oh shit, I don't want to be fucked. I'm going to side with whoever I think is going to win and save my own ass. That is their wake up. That reminds me of uh, a line from uh, Transformers 3. What my dad told me is that when it's not your war, you join the side that's going to win. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you know what else I think is funny too? Um, all these politicians at first in our Congress, they all signed off on Obamacare, which, you know, was like 50 trillion pages no one ever read. And now all of a sudden... Because they didn't read it, it's biting them in the ass because the reason all of them are against Obamacare right now is all of a sudden that gets implemented and Obama's like, hey, by the way, it's not just the people that have to choose Obamacare. It's you guys too. So you can't have the medical luxuries that you've been used to having. You're in this system too. And so they're like, wait. A minute you put us in with the sheeple we didn't know that well you didn't read the bill before you signed it <laughs> well we don't like this anymore now <laughs> so that's that's why they're raising hell about obamacare if they didn't find out that they were they've been tossed in with the rest of us they wouldn't be bitching about Obamacare. They'd be like, yeah, we love it. It's candy. You know what they'll do? Is they'll just put an amendment in that exempts them. You know, that's the that's what they'll be prepared to accept. Well, the only problem is, is the whole Obamacare system is crumbling fast. That there's uh, there's no way Obamacare can continue to exist much longer, even if they tried to write it into law that it has to, because the whole infrastructure of it is just imploding, and you can't for someone to have Obamacare if Obamacare no longer actually exists. The whole thing is imploding and is annihilating itself and is making itself cease to exist because it's that big of a piece of shit that it can't even sustain itself as a false flag. <laughs> Alright, well it's been a, uh, a pleasure to have, be chatting with you here, bro. Thanks very much for inviting me on. You as well and uh, thank you. And um, I hope everybody goes and checks out my website, uh, thevinnieeastwoodshow.com. And if you want to listen in, uh, Monday through Thursday, four nights a week, AmericanFreedomRadio.com is back after 18 months being down. It's going to be fantastic. Ooh, why was it down? Ah, personal reasons. Network owner didn't want to do it for uh, anymore. And then uh, over a period of time, he reconsidered. Oh, okay. Well, glad it's back up then. Oh, yeah. And yeah, everybody, you know, everybody check out um, the Vinnie Eastwood show. Otherwise, Kiss and Jer will rape your dog and send you the homage to live for the rest of your life. Yeah, or get one of his, his patsies to do it for you. Yeah, yeah. That too. <laughs> Okay.
Perfect, thank you. If you really want enlightenment, then just lighten up.